Here we are, lesson number 12, the life of Jesus. And we are reviewing events that took place in the sixth section entitled The Last Passover and Crucifixion Week. That's where we're at. So in last week's lesson, Jesus has come to Jerusalem. He's confronted all of the religious leaders there one last time. They've rejected Him and He has pronounced judgment on them and the nation of Israel by describing the events that will take place when Jerusalem will be destroyed some 40 years forward. And you know, there's always argument about that passage in Matthew uh, and people are saying, oh, that, those are the end times and so on and so forth. You know, they're always trying to interpret that as, as, a, as, as a passage that's referring to the end of the world. And yet Jesus goes to Jerusalem and He's talking to the leaders and He's saying to them, you've rejected me and this is what's going to happen to you. In context, it makes a lot of sense that what He's talking to them is about the destruction of their world. The it'll be the end of the world, all right, but it'll be the end of the world for these Jewish leaders, these priests, these Pharisees, these people, these leaders of the nation who have rejected Him over a period of three years. He pronounces judgment on them. Of course, He uses eschatological language to do it, but nevertheless, in context, He's talking about what happens in 70 AD. Okay, so the last scene, last time we were together, sees Judas plotting with the Jewish leadership to betray Jesus uh, into their hands. Now, we've divided the final events into different days of that last week. Gives it a little more presence, I think. So far, we've looked at the events that took place from Sunday to Wednesday. Today, we're going to look at the story on Thursday morning as Jesus prepares the Passover meal. Make sure the clicker works. All right, there we go. Thursday, April the 6th. <coughs> Event number 129, the disciples are sent to prepare the Passover, um, the Passover meal. It says week, but actually the Passover meal. The Passover meal was coming on the following day, which would begin that evening. So Jesus sends Peter and John to go ahead and prepare the meal, and He tells them that they're to go into the city, and when they get to the city, they're going to find a man who's carrying water. And uh, that would have been easy for them to find because during that particular time in that society, men did not carry the water, women carried the water. So to see a man carrying the water would kind of make that person stand out. And uh, this person would lead them to a room where they were to prepare the feast. Now preparing the feast meant to provide the lamb that was sacrificed at the temple and then the meat would be cooked, um, unleavened bread and bitter herbs, the bitter herbs, uh, something like cucumber and lettuce in, in a kind of a bitter dressing, a sour dressing. Uh, wine, uh, along with uh, cushions and cups and plates and waters and towel, water and towels for the uh, foot washing that would take place, which was simply a common courtesy of the time. So Jesus knew that they'd find the man. Some say he had prepared in advance. The text suggests that the Lord used His divine knowledge to prepare all of this. You could argue that all day long. The point was they found Him, they began to prepare the, uh, the meal. Event 130, Friday, April the 7th, Jesus eats the Passover with His apostles and here all four apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all begin their uh, own description of this time. Remember, as we've gone through these, you see sometimes Matthew describes something, but not Luke. Mark will talk about something, but not John. But as we get into the passion part, the, the final supper and the, the passion of Christ, all four apostles will write about these, and I'm not going to verbally tell you all the passages. You can get them off the, off the screen. They're in your notes, and uh, folks who are watching this online uh, are seeing the uh, slide. So each gospel writer describes this key event and each places some details in different order. Matthew and John were there. So in combining the accounts of Matthew and John, you sort of get the flow of what happened in an, in an, orderly, in an orderly fashion. So in a kind of an orderly fashion, Jesus gathers the 12 in the upper room in order to celebrate the Passover. Peter and John had set up the dinner and they had taken the places nearest to Jesus. You know, I mean, why not? <laughs> and uh, I've told you this before, but 
you know that famous picture where you see Jesus in the middle and all the apostles you know, going down to on either side, that's not accurate historically. The tables were low in those days, they sat on the floor on cushions, and the tables were like a U, okay? like a square U, but like you know, a U. And uh, the first place, not in the middle here, but the first place at, at one end of the table was the host or the person that took care of the, of the main host you know, who, who would get up and get things. He was seated first and then you had the host or the principal person, the most important person. And then after him, in order of importance, they would go down to the other end of the table. So what places do Peter and John take? Well, you know, well, the first spot, then Jesus, then the next spot, and then everybody else in order of, quote, importance. Well, you know, what happens? As a result, you find out that a dispute arises among them. You ever wonder why there's, is there a dispute that arises? Well, you know, the pecking order has been set. The two best spots have been taken. The rest of them are left to go down in order of importance. And so there's a dispute. What about? Well, who's the, mo who's the greatest? Why should I be sitting here? I'm older than he is. Why am I sitting down here? Why is Peter up there? You know, so on and so on and so forth. So Jesus then tells them the greatest are those who serve and He promises them that they will be in the kingdom. And then after this teaching, He takes the water and the towel set up for the foot washing and He washes all of their feet, including the feet of Judas, the one who's going to betray Him. Now the water and the towel, that was, nothing, that was not anything spectacular, nothing out of the ordinary. It was custom, it was common courtesy in those times. Uh, that the uh, youngest slave in the house would be given the task of washing the feet of the guests. They came in sandals, they, they walked a long way along dirty roads, and so uh, today we have, you know, we have you, know, you, you wipe your feet on the carpet or you take your shoes off, you know, whatever. Some, some hosts will provide perhaps some paper slippers. In those days, the youngest slave, the one who was the least, was the one assigned to washing the feet of the guests. Well, guess what? None of the apostles, you know, they, they, they all walked in, saw the water, kept walking, saw the water, walked in. Well, I'm not going to wash the feet. Well, where's the guy to wash the feet? Well, I'm not going to be the one to wash the feet. Let him wash the feet. And so no, everybody walks in without any foot washing and sits down. So what does Jesus do? Well, he gets up and he go get the water, he go get the towel, and he does the foot washing. He takes the position of the least slave, the least honorable position at the highest feast moment of the year, he takes the least position. The one who was in the, the seat of honor takes the least position. He washes all of their feet. And he does so in order to demonstrate his point about first comes the teaching, the least among you will be the greatest, then comes the actual uh, object lesson of washing the feet. So after taking his place at the table, he then indicates to them that there's a betrayer among them. And he shows Peter and John who this is by offering Judas a piece of bread dipped into the bitter herbs. And after this, Judas leaves the room. Notice also, again, between the lines, Judas had all this time to change his mind. All this time he's had to change his mind. He's had the person that he's going to betray kneeling in front of him, washing his feet. He's had all this time to change his mind and still he doesn't, and still he leaves, and goes about his business. After Judas leaves, Jesus prays for the apostles and what they will do after his death. He prays for Peter uh, to, uh, uh, to be saved from Satan's, uh, from Satan's attacks. He foretells their abandonment of him and how he will restore them. He tells them that he will meet them again in Galilee. All of these things take place as they're sharing the traditional Passover meal, next, uh, next uh, event, number 131. Jesus initiates the Lord's Supper. Again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke this time. So during the time of Jesus, the Jews would eat the Passover in the following way. They, would, they didn't just dig in, it wasn't just a meal, it was a, a ceremonial meal that they would have. So the meat was the sacrifice that was, every, every element had a, a meaning. So the meat was the sacrifice um, slain on their behalf. The bitter herbs represented their bitter, difficult experience in Egypt when they were slaves. 
The unleavened bread represented haste. When they left, we, we know that story, you know, they were in a hurry, and so they took unleavened bread and, and, and left with that, and that's what that represented. The wine, which was not used in the original Passover meal when they were in Egypt, but was added later on, uh, represented actually two things, the blood that was shed in Egypt and also the good life that they had in the promised land. So that, the wine element was added much later in their history, but by the time that Jesus was there was a firm part of the, uh, of the um, Passover meal. And so the way they would do it is that the leader of the household or the host, usually the father, or the patriarch of the home, uh, would offer prayers and then eat and drink. There were four cups of wine and the others would follow his lead. So if he took meat, they took meat. If he took the bread and he dipped it, they took the bread and he dipped it. If he took the wine and offered a blessing, they would take the wine and share the blessing. So it was again a ceremonial meal. And then through this meal at some point, the youngest one, a child usually, would ask, why are we doing this? Would ask the host, the father, the grandfather, why are we doing this? And this would be the setup, this would be the opportunity for the leader, the host, the father, to begin to tell the story of the Jewish exodus from Egypt. So the meal served as a platform to bring the story of the exodus to the family, year after year after year. So Jesus served as leader, and he led them through the meal, and once the food was gone and there remained only one piece of unleavened bread, and there was the final cup, because there were four that they took normally, there was the final cup of wine to drink, he changed the significance of the meal at the very end. From now on, the bread would represent his body offered up for their sins. And we know that, we're not going to go into the theological implications of that, we understand that. And from now on, the wine would represent his blood, shed to obtain life for sinners. And this memorial meal would no longer remember the Jews' freedom from Egyptian bondage. It would now commemorate their own personal freedom from the bondage of sin because of his body and because of his blood. And so we move on to uh, event 132, the farewell address and prayer, John 14 to 17. You want to study a prayer? Study this prayer, three chapters long. Three chapters long, only John records it. This is the longest uninterrupted passage where Jesus speaks, contained in the New Testament. In this long prayer and exhortation, um, uh, He gives while they were standing. John 14, 31, standing in the upper room, and in it he covers a lot of things. He says a lot of things, don't have time, I'll just give you the bullet points here. First of all, he gives them an assurance that he is the way to heaven, and he will prepare a place for them. He gives them a guarantee that their request to God in his name will be answered. Their requests, when he's gone, when they make requests in his name, God will answer their requests. He makes a promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit to comfort and to, to teach them. Uh, gives an exhortation to remain faithful and fruitful and draw strength from Him as a branch draws strength from the vine. Um, he gives them a warning of future persecutions to come and also an explanation of what the Holy Spirit will do for and in them when He comes. He will convict sinners, he'll comfort them, he'll inspire them, he'll bring them to remembrance. I mean, how could they remember? It's hard enough to remember all the things he said just in these three chapters. They would have to remember everything he said and did over a period of three years. Of course they needed divine assistance to be able to remember accurately those things and accurately to record them, but he, he assures them that God will help them in the work that they will do. And then of course an encouragement not to quit when they're rejected by the world, that He will be with them and give them peace. And at this point, they all confess their faith in Him. And then a prayer to God on their behalf so that God will unite and protect and glorify Himself through them. And then once He finished this long discourse, they sang the Hallel, what's called the Hallel, and the Hallel comes from Psalms 115, 16, 17, and 18. If you want to see the words 
used in the song that, the, you know, it says, and then they, they rose, they sang a song, and then they went off to the, the garden. Go to Psalm 115 to 118. Those are the words. Those are parts of those psalms that they sang. It was custom at that time to sing, called the Hallel. Those, those psalms together were called that. And then they departed from the, from the room that they were in. <clears throat> 133, the agony and betrayal in the garden, and now the darkness really begins. Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John all describe this. I've mentioned to you in the past the Mount of Olives uh, on the east side of Jerusalem was covered with olive trees, still is covered with olive trees, and it had an olive press where oil, where olive oil was made. That, as a matter of fact, the word Gethsemane means olive press, so it's not, it wasn't like a fancy word, it's just, you know, that's where the olive press is, the Garden of Olives where the olive press, Gethsemane. Um, Jesus takes the apostles there to pray with Him during His final hours, and of course He brings Peter and James and John a little more deeply into the garden, and then He goes even further to find a secluded place to uh, pray. Three times he returns to find the apostles sleeping while he agonized in prayer concerning what was to take place. His final prayer is so intense, the Bible says that he sweats blood, drops of blood, and eventually he accepts what is to take place. In other words, his human nature, a lot of people say, why, why the struggle? You know, he's the son of God. Well, he's also a man. And human beings who are in their right mind do not want to die. Right? It's not, it's not normal to want to die. We, we, we don't want to die. I mean, God made us that way. We want to live. So He was a human being. He was a normal in the sense that He was not crazy or anything like that. And so, humanly, He didn't, he didn't you know, want to suffer. He didn't want to die. He, he wasn't looking. He wasn't some kind of masochist that got some sort of pleasure out of, out of pain. It took a great a deal of will for him to eventually accept that this is what needed to be done. So a lot of people worry about that part or you know, debate that part. Well, you know, as the Son of God, the Divine Son is in perfect union with the Father, but the, the human part of him went through the human, you know, the human steps of accepting a difficult decision, like all of us. You know, having to do something we don't like. You know, sometimes we, we have to think about it and pray about it and say, we finally take a deep breath and say, well, look, maybe this is the way, it's just got to be this way and I'm just going to get through it. You know, well, this is, this is the process that we're seeing here with Jesus. In the meantime, Judas has organized a mob of people to come and seize him, which he does by kissing Jesus to indicate which of the men they were to arrest. And Peter lops off the ear of one of the men, a man called Malchus, and Luke says that Jesus healed him. Don't find out much about Malchus, you know, uh, but uh, he must have been pretty impressed with what happened to him that night. So the mob takes him away while the apostles scatter in safety. Peter and John follow uh, the uh, mob that has taken Jesus. Uh, Jesus before the high priest, 134. Now at first, he's brought before Anus or Annas. Um, uh, Annas was the father of Caiaphas. And sometimes it's confusing. It says uh, Annas was the high priest. And then it says Caiaphas was the high priest. Well, the idea was if you were the high priest, you had a title and you had it for life. Like, the, like Mr. Bush, we call him President Bush. Even though he's not in office, he always keeps that title. Well, in the same way, when you were the high priest, even after you retired, you kept that title. So they referred to him as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas. But Caiaphas was the one who was you know, in power at that time. Eventually a council is convened in the middle of the night with the high priest presiding. And in the meantime, Peter and some think John have worked their way into the courtyard and there they're challenged as um, uh, disciples of the uh, prisoner Jesus, which uh, of course Peter denies vehemently, even says he curses. He curses. And uh, just as Jesus told him. Now during the trial, which by the way was illegal according to uh, Jewish law, because it was at night, you weren't allowed to have a trial at night, uh, witnesses were brought forward to accuse Jesus, but their testimony was contradictory. And finally the high priest, you know, he gives up, he's all the witnesses, so he goes to the one witness who can actually tell the truth and he asks Jesus, you know, is this true? Are you the Son of God? Well, Jesus can't deny himself. 
And so he gives his own witness. You, you have said it. And so imagine, think now of the absurdity of this thing. He's had people there, the high priest, accusing him of stuff, contradicting each other. They can't get their story straight. So they, they go to the accused and ask him to incriminate himself and Jesus can't deny himself, so he does. So the only, the witness by which he was condemned is him. <laughs> so anyways, I thought it was kind of strange. <laughs> but anyways, maybe you're not in the same mood as I was in when I was writing this stuff. Anyways, <laughs> number 135. Jesus before Pilate and Herod. Again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John all record it. So at first Jesus is brought before Annas and then he's brought before Pilate and then Herod. Now the Jews, as you probably know, were not allowed by law to execute anyone. They had to convince the Roman officials that a prisoner was worthy of death and they would do the execution or at least give them permission to do the execution. Pilate was the Roman proconsul. He controlled the province with Roman soldiers. Interesting, he appointed the high priest. Remember we talked about that before. And he even, he controlled the, the treasury. He even maintained the garments of the high priest. The garments of the high priest at that time were under lock and key uh, with the Roman governor. And, 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 and uh, uh, Pilate would, would release the garments for the, high, you know, for the high season, for the high holidays, uh, for Passover, when the high priest had to put on his garments, then he would go get them. That's how far you know, the, the nation had fallen, how much under control they were of Rome and how much they despised uh, the, uh, the Romans. So Jesus' appearance before Pilate occurred in the following order. One, the uh, Jews bring him, accusing him and demanding his death, and Pilate questions him and sends him to Herod. Herod was the Jewish, quote, ruler. He, he, he ruled under the pleasure of of, of Pilate. Pilate had the army, he had the military, he had the bullets. You know. uh, Herod was a political ruler. Herod tries to get Jesus to do a miracle for him and when this fails he sends him back to Pilate. Pilate questions Jesus again not finding any basis for execution. He tries to free him and under the tradition of freeing a prisoner at the Passover but the crowd as we know selects Barabbas instead, an insurrectionist, a terrorist. And then Pilate's wife warns him against condemning Jesus, but he gives in to the pressure of the crowd and turns Jesus over to the soldiers for the execution. Once sentenced, the soldiers then begin to torture Jesus and humiliate him and prepare him for execution. This was the Roman way with, an with, a, uh, with a condemned prisoner. The first phase was to destroy him psychologically. They weren't satisfied just killing him. They first destroyed the person psychologically. That's why you know, uh, they taunted him. You know, You're the king of the Jews, ha, ha, ha. Put the purple robe on him, beat him, and they broke him psychologically. And then when he was broken, then they killed him. And they killed him slowly. That was, that was their method. 136, Jesus, uh, Judas' suicide. After seeing what has happened, Judas is stricken with guilt because he's betrayed an innocent man. He still doesn't believe, but what he's seen tells him, well, th this guy doesn't deserve everything that's happened to him, and he feels guilty about that. He returns the money, hangs himself in despair. 137, Jesus is crucified. Again, Matthew, uh, excuse me, yeah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He carries his own cross with the help from Simon of Cyrene to the place of execution. Golgotha means the place of, of the skull. Now he's offered drugged wine and they offered them drugged wine, they gave them that in order to crucify them without resistance. I mean, who's going to let somebody you know, nail his feet and his hands to a piece of wood with a, with a big spike? You know? So they gave them the drugged wine to sedate them you know, temporarily, so that they can handle them and put them on the cross properly. So he's crucified between two thieves, and they in the crowd mock and challenge him to save himself. Once he's secured with nails and hoisted in an upright position, he asks the Father to forgive his tormentors. That all by itself proves he's the Son of God. Right there. The Romans put a sign above his head that says, King of the Jews, which the Jewish leaders objected to. They wanted, he said he was the King of the Jews, but Pilate refuses. 
138, going a little quickly here, Jesus dies on the cross. All four writers uh, talk about this. You know, it's amazing how much each writer provides an enormous amount of detail as to what happened during just a few hours that Jesus was on the cross. Just the little details. You know, one of the thieves repents of what he has said and asks Jesus to save him, uh, which he does by promising him that he'd be in, uh, in paradise. Uh, the soldiers who are gambling for and divide his clothing. You know, all these little historical details. They're not important. What, what, what's the important? What the soldiers were doing at the cross, but it, it, it colors the picture in. Uh, 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 Jesus gives John the charge to keep his mother. Some people say, why not Peter? Well, he wasn't related to Peter, but he was related to John. Uh, Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. and from noon to 3 p.m. the sky was darkened. Jesus cries out to God not to forsake him and then he says he's thirsty. And then he declares that his mission is complete saying it is finished. And he dies by offering up his life in the words, Father into thy hands I commit my spirit. Words so many times that we use at funerals for individuals, especially for brothers and sisters. Um, he dies by offering up his uh, life uh, with those words. And at this point, the veil in the temple at the entrance of the Holy and Holies is torn in two, and many who were dead come out of the tombs, but only his own resurrection. And there was an earthquake, and because of these signs, even the centurion at the foot of the cross believed. I mention all these little details here because they're historical details. You don't find these kind of details when you read about fables and mysteries and things like that. Now once he died, the soldiers pierced his side to make sure and the, um, the process of burial begins. Joseph of Arimathea comes to claim the body from Pilate and along with Nicodemus, they wrap Jesus' body and place it into a new tomb belonging to Joseph, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, who was Jesus' mother's sister. <laughs> okay. Again, I keep reminding you, these people were related. They remain by the tomb. Mary Magdalene and his aunt, Mary, all the three Marys, remember that sermon, the three Marys? They're, they're there and they wait till sunset, the beginning of the Sabbath. Their goal was to properly prepare the body for burial, but, the sunset, uh, but with the sunset and the Sabbath beginning, they couldn't do it, so they planned to return. Last one we're going to do tonight since our time is over. Just uh, please uh, stay with me here. 139, Pilate sets a seal on the tomb. Saturday, April the 7th, the Lord is buried, the crowds have dispersed, uh, but the Jews are still trying to make you know, sure that his influence is extinguished. So uh, not only does Pilate put a seal, the Jewish leaders who were afraid that Jesus' followers would steal the body and claim resurrection somehow, Pilate tells them, hey, go take a guard and add to my guard and go seal the tomb um, uh, for yourselves. All right, well, I want to make just one important uh, observation rather than a whole bunch of lessons as we finish out our time together here for this lesson. Just one thing, and here's the lesson. Keep the main thing the main thing. If you permit me just one minute to talk about this. You know, writers spent more time writing about the events that covered the few hours of Jesus' death and resurrection than all of the three years of His ministry. More time spent on this than all of the three years. And so the Holy Spirit makes this the central event in our religion. If this is so, then we also need to remember something that's important. We need to understand and teach this as our central doctrine. The central doctrine of Christianity is the death and the resurrection of Christ to save mankind. And, and we shouldn't get sidetracked too much by too many other issues. Sometimes I hear guys debating some things you know, that are like, oh dear, you know. I mean, I won't even mention it, but you know what I'm saying. You know, they, 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 they'll waste so much ink on the minor issues and won't spend any time on what is important in our religion. 
You know, we need to give greater importance to the sharing of the communion each week because it represents the central issue of our spiritual lives and the central issue of the Bible. You know, when, when the elders or the, the individual who's up there doing the devotional says, this is the most important thing. He's not just talking about the ceremony. What he's trying to say is, this thing that we do represents the most important thing in the gospel and the most important and central thing to our religion, and that is the death and burial of Christ and His resurrection. Why is that? Because it is the first that reflects our own. I'm a Christian because Christ has promised my resurrection. So every time I take the communion, I'm not only remembering His, I'm looking forward to mine. So let's, let's, try, to, you know, let's try to keep the main thing, the main thing, uh, when we share personally with other people, it's okay they ask you, you know, why, why don't you use an instrument or, or you know, why do you meet every Sunday or so on and so on. And those, we have answers for that. But let's, let's not just give them that information, let's make sure we give them the main information from the gospel. Okay, that's our lesson for today. Remember what I said about lesson 13. Thank you very much. <laughs>